Hello, I'm Judy Sternberg, president of the League of Women Voters of the Rochester Metropolitan Area. The League is pleased to co-sponsor this important debate between the candidates for the 56th State Senate District with WROC-TV News 8. The League of Women Voters is a nonpartisan political organization that does not support or oppose candidates or political parties. We believe informed voters are the backbone of our democracy and encourage active participation in government. To that end, voters should be finalizing their plans for voting this current general election. If you've submitted an application for an absentee ballot over two weeks ago and have not yet received one, please contact the Board of Elections. Once you have received your ballot, complete and return it as soon as possible. Remember that absentee ballots can either be returned by mail or delivered to drop boxes at the Board of Elections or at any early voting or election day polling site. In-person voters should be deciding where and when they will cast their vote. Early voting begins on October 24th and runs through Sunday, November 1st. Check the Board of Elections website for more information on early voting and election day polling sites. Lastly, we invite you to learn more about the candidates on your ballot through the League of Women Voters Voter Guide at vote411.org. Thank you. From your local election headquarters, this is a special presentation of News 8. News 8 is your local election headquarters. I'm Maureen McGuire, and thank you for joining us. The 2020 election has almost arrived, and voters throughout the state are preparing for when and how they plan to cast their ballots. As a reminder, Election Day is November 3rd. If you're in need of an absentee ballot, the deadline to submit your application for one is October 27th. And early voting begins throughout the state on the 24th. We are continuing a series of debates to help you get to know the candidates running in significant local races today in a special debate via Zoom. We are pleased to present your candidates for the 56th State Senate District, which covers the Monroe County towns of Greece, Gates, Hamlin, Parma, Clarkson, and Brighton, and parts of the city of Rochester, including Charlotte. Our candidates are Democrat Jeremy Cooney, a former aide to the late Congresswoman Louise Slaughter, and a former chief of staff to Rochester Mayor Lovely Warren, and Republican Mike Berry, who is a current councilman for the town of Greece and former executive director of the Rochester Monroe County Youth Bureau. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thanks, Maureen. We will begin Thanks, with Maureen. opening statements. Each candidate will have one minute, starting with Jeremy Cooney. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Jeremy Cooney. I'm the Democrat running in the 56th Senate District. I want to thank Channel 8, and I want to thank the League of Women Voters for putting, for putting together tonight's debate. And thank you for being flexible for us to use Zoom in this time of COVID. I think flexibility is the word of 2020. Flexibility when it comes to st uh, students and teachers and parents trying to reopen schools safely. Flexibility when it comes to keeping our roofs over our head when we're dealing with landlords and tenants. Flexibility for small business owners who are trying to work very hard to reopen safely. This is a time that requires real leadership, leadership that can deliver. I've been working for the last 15 years at all three levels of government, including for two New York governors. I'm ready to lead and I'm ready to have a great conversation tonight. Thank you. All right, thank you very thank much. You. And we'll now hear much. the opening statement from Mike Barry. Thanks Maureen, thanks for having me tonight. You know, as she said, my name is Mike Barry. I've been living right here in Monroe County in the 56th district, whether it was my grandfather's restaurant at the Crescent Beach Hotel as a kid, or working for the past seven years as a Greece town councilman here in the first ward of Greece. I've been a public school teacher, a coach motivating our youth to be the best that they can be. And I've come to the rescue of certain youth as the county's youth uh, bureau executive director. I ran the safe harbor program, which saves our children from the predatory folks of safe of sex trafficking. Our community has been and always will be my home. I'm proud to call it mine with my wife and my three children. This community has been so good to me and I want to ensure that it does the same for everyone. That's why I'm running for New York State Senate. I want every family to have the ability to succeed, to grow, and to flourish right here in the 56. To me, that means making our schools receive their fair share of school aid, 
maintaining funding for our law enforcement and for our public safety, while paying for all the changes that COVID has brought our way. Come from a family of small business owners, and now more than ever, we need to rally behind small business. We need to make sure that no mandates suppress them and keep them from being successful. None of this is gonna be easy. It's gonna take someone with energy, someone with a passion for our community, and a willingness to get creative and collaborate with the other side of the aisle. As our next state senator, I will be that person. And with your support, I know we can improve our quality of life for this generation and for generations to come. All right, Mr. Berry, thank you. For the next hour, each candidate will have a minute and a half to answer the questions posed to them. The other candidate will have one minute to reply if he so chooses, and then if the situation warrants, 30 seconds back to the first candidate and so on. Obviously, because we are not all together in person, the timing for our answers may be a little fluid, but we do have all agreed to do our best to stick to the time limits. Prior to this debate, both candidates agreed to have Mr. Cooney go first. So here is the first question. Mr. Cooney, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, New York State revenues have plummeted and expenses have skyrocketed. The state is now facing a $15 billion budget deficit and local municipalities are pleading for help and direction from the governor and state lawmakers. What should the state do to help? Be specific. Be specific. This is a really tough time for the state of New York. We don't know all the results just yet, but we can tell that coming up in next month, we're gonna learn what the sales tax and the property tax revenue numbers are gonna be. So we'll have a firmer number of what our budget will look like. But I've had these conversations proactively with both our county executive, Adam Bello, who's supporting my campaign, and also with a series of town leaders and the mayor to figure out how we can come up with a solution that Rochester gets a fair share. We have to be at the table. Uh, right now, I'm very worried that when it comes to building roads and bridges, when it comes to reopening our schools, when it comes to making sure that our small business owners get the support that they need and that we are able to transition back to a healthier economy, we can't fall behind. And that's the reality that's happening right now. It's not just an upstate downstate thing. This is a east and west thing. Rochester is falling behind Buffalo. It's falling behind Syracuse. We need to have a seat at the table in the New York State Senate majority. I am running for this seat because over the last three years, people are fed up and frustrated that we haven't gotten results. It's time that we send a leader to Albany who has the relationships in the Senate majority to be able to bring back those resources, whether it's to Adam Bellow or whether it's to a town supervisor because our people can't wait and we can't hurt even more than we already have. Thank you. All right, Mr. Berry, would you like to respond? Yes, please, Maureen. You know, I guess I just don't share that same dim view of our community and of Rochester and of upstate New York. This is a great community. It's a community full of small businesses, families that are trying to uh, not just survive, but to thrive even through a pandemic. And you know what? Having a seat at the table is one thing. I'm endorsed by our current Senator, Senator Joe Robach. Joe is represented this community with a plum and with passion for the last 20 years. And he's made sure to deliver even while the Senator uh, is in the minority right now. And it's more important than ever, and I know it might not be uh, you know, fashionable to say upstate versus downstate, but that's exactly what it is. We are in a fight for survival and we're in a fight for budget dollars, especially as we try to pay for COVID and all the changes that have been brought our way. We need to make sure we have a fighter that's in there for upstate New York, for our community, and is not gonna uh, kowtow to downstate interests just for favorability. We need to make sure that we get our fair share when it comes to education, when it comes to law enforcement, and when it comes to our infrastructure and quality of life here in upstate New York, and I will be that fighter. Maureen, can I respond on that point? All right, 30 seconds, Mr. 30 Cooney. 30 seconds, Mr. Cooney. So let's look at the numbers over the last two years where Senator Robach's been in the minority. $70.2 million in transportation funding for Syracuse. $100 million more in transportation funding for the city in the Erie County area of Buffalo. Rochester stayed flat. That's the reality that we're in. If we don't have a seat at the table, we're not gonna get our fair share. Thank you. Maureen, I'm sorry, just one thing. So we yeah. should just bow to the governor for taking it out on upstate New York and not giving them dollars that we deserve merely because he doesn't wanna help upstate for political differences, that's not right. We need to be able to work across the aisle and be collaborative. We need to make sure that we do reach across the aisle. Thank you. 
All right, Mr. Berry. This next question is for you. New York State was once ground zero in this pandemic. Today, it's got one of the lowest COVID-19 infection rates in the nation. To what do you attribute that success? And would you support another full lockdown if the infection rate increases to an unmanageable level? Well, thanks for letting me have that loaded question first, Maureen. Uh, you know, there are so many things that you can look at with COVID. First of all, the first two weeks of this pandemic, when it struck, I loved how we all banded together as a community. And you know what, I know a lot of us are still banded together as a community, helping each other out, whether it's through financial uh, resources, making sure that we still hit businesses that are needing those people to come in day in and day out so that those business owners and those employees can put food on the table for their families. And you know what, even in the first two weeks of this, I, I thought the governor did a great job because no one knew what was going on. No one knew what to expect. This virus is new and we were all in it together. And we said, okay, if it means staying home, if it means wearing masks, let's do what's safe and protect one another. And we should still protect one another. We should still be united and still collaborate together. But as we go through this, here we are in week 31, Maureen, and there are things that we've learned as we've gone along the way. The thousands of seniors who have died at the hands of bad decision-making from uh, downstate legislators and those who are in that thinking, they threw COVID-infected patients in with them and basically gave them a die-in-place statement. And we cannot allow that again. We have to defend our seniors. They're dying, our World War II veterans are in these homes and they're dying left and right because of poor decision making. And what we can do also is make sure that we have our businesses. We've lost 48% of our businesses here in upstate New York due to shutdowns and for mandates. And as I, I, I'm in a family of small business owners, I see firsthand the oppression that is placed upon them by unnecessary mandates. You can have a safe business, you can open up safely, but the business has to be allowed to open to do that. Right. And you know what, we need to take away those mandates as we move forward. And to answer your question, if there's a second lockdown, what we need to make sure as a country is that we make the best decision together as a community. We need to be united in that front. And personally, the lockdown, to do it again, without having small business represented and business in general represented in that decision making would be a mistake. We need to be able to make sure that our economy moves forward, that people are safe first and foremost, and that people are in this in a unified decision-making effort together. Right. What I think a lot of people have left that collaborative, that left the unity, is we see the hypocrisy from downstate to upstate. And when we were told that this is a life and death matter, ventilators, when they were at what was thought right. to be something that was the hottest commodity and the most needed, the governor and downstate legislators of his ilk said, we're right, taking Mr. ventilators Mr. from upstate because downstate is more important. All right, Mr. Barry, we're gonna- allow Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. okay. Uh, the bottom line, though, is that you would not support another full lockdown if the situation warranted moving. I don't think forward. our economy could, su could survive it. No, I don't support that. Okay. I Jeremy. want people Jeremy. for safety in our economy, making sure people can put food on the table for their families. All right. And Mr. Right. Cooney, you, would you like to respond? I would very much so. Leadership matters. Leadership is not pointing the finger at someone else saying they didn't do a good job. Leadership is about standing up and doing what's right, telling the truth, following the facts, and keeping people safe. I, like millions of not only New Yorkers, but Americans, tuned in every morning when Governor Cuomo was doing his daily briefings, telling us the facts because we couldn't get the leadership from the White House. That was unacceptable, and it still remains unacceptable. And right here in Rochester, like so many others, I supported Adam Bellow and the leadership of our county health department under Dr. Mendoza, who did the right things by using masks and enforcing social distance and making sure people were washing their hands. That's how we got the results we got. That's how we kept people safe. That's how we're saving lives. Over 200,000 Americans have died because of COVID-19 and because a president of the United States refuses to believe this is a serious pandemic. Leadership matters and we need to have leadership on the state level that recognizes it. And I Mr. do support Cooney. making sure that our regional control center All right. can safely reopen our businesses here in Monroe County and can do so in an appropriate way, even if it's different than other parts. All right, thank you, Mr. thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Sorry, Mr. Yep, go ahead, Ms. Spirit. Ahead. That one minute? I get too excited, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, so, you know, you're right. Leadership does mean standing up and doing what's right. And killing thousands of seniors was not the right move. And those families are standing up right now in protest saying, what about our seniors? And they want that investigation to know what's going on with them. And you know what? 
certain things that were decided, you could say in hindsight, oh, we shouldn't have done that. But knowing if you're putting someone in when you know it's infective and you know it's gonna harm people, that's a bad decision. And that's not placing blame, that's placing responsibility. And that's what we need to know. But let us first thank those who came to the aid. It wasn't Mendoza and it wasn't Bellow. It was all of our doctors, our nurses, our people who were in the hospital saving people, making sure that they had what they needed. Jeremy, I know your wife is in the medical field and I know that we have family members, cousins and friends and loved ones who are facing that front line, making sure that people are safe. Those are the heroes. Those are the people who, who stood up and said, I'm the leader. I'm putting my life at risk to make sure those people get the safety and the care that they need. Thanks, so Mr. I'm Barry. all about standing up and applauding those who did the work. And that's those on the front right. line. Thank you, Mr. You Barry. know what? That's where we need to keep that, uh, that responsibility at, is right. at those right. including us on the front line. Thank you, Mr. Maureen. Barry. We're going to move on because, Mr. Cooney, th hey, this one may... One thing real quick, may... Maureen. Uh, uh, go these ahead. These workers ahead. absolutely agree with Mike that they have been on the front line and have been leading. And that's why I'm so proud to have the support of the nurses, of the healthcare workers, and the teachers who have been on the front line. And they've endorsed my campaign because they know I have their back and I will have their back and all. All right, Mr. Mr. Cooney. We're going to move on. We have a on. few more questions about the pandemic. Uh, this question is for you. As we head into the winter months, there is concern that New York State could experience a second wave of coronavirus. So lay out a plan, be specific that the legislature can support for how to guide all of us, not just through a second wave, but for the duration of this public health crisis. So I would say back to a point I raised earlier, Monroe County has done a good job. So let's rely on a regional waste basis for reopening. Uh, it is time that we have a serious conversation about getting our small businesses back open uh, I am proud to be endorsed by the Chamber of Commerce. I've had this conversation with a number of small businesses in our area. I'm very frustrated by the lack of communication and consistency. Uh, clearly, we need an advocate fighting for us in the state legislature who will stand up and get results. But I think having a regional approach makes sense. This one size fits all for New York just doesn't work. And so now as we see that we're opening movie theaters soon, hopefully we get comedy clubs back open soon. Hopefully we get our arts. I miss our arts in Rochester. Hopefully they come back soon too. And I think we're different. We are different here in the Finger Lakes region, here in Monroe County. And I think it's important that we have representatives who recognize that and have the courage to be able to pick up the phone and call the governor and to make sure that he knows that as well. Mr. Barry, would you like to respond? Would you like to respond? You made a couple of good points. You know what? We do need to collaborate and we do need to make sure that we can pick up the phone and call our representatives and get their help. You know, in 2017, we needed just that here in the shoreline in the town of Greece. High water levels brought on by the IJC, terrible uh, decision making there for 2014, their plan. People were losing their homes. People were losing their businesses. People were losing their quality of life. And we had to work with other folks from other sides of the aisle, higher government. We worked with Governor Cuomo. We worked with Senator Schumer. And I'll be the first one to tell you, they helped us out. Senator Schumer showed up when we needed him. Governor Cuomo has been a little late to the game on what we need now, but Senator Schumer was there for us. And it was because of myself, our town board member, Supervisor Rylick here in the town of Greece, a collaboration, a unified effort. And that's what we can do with anything that comes at us in the state Senate. You know, it's the town of Greece is the fifth largest town in the state of New York, 100, almost 100,000 people. And it is not the only portion of the 56th district. There is a huge diverse geographical and uh, population stance there that we need to make sure we can apply those methods that we do in Greece and in other successful portions of the district and bring it to everybody. There's no reason that we can't work together and pick this phone up and say whether they're Democrat, Republican, whatever political party, we want to work together because we want the best for those that are electing us. And that's the main point. All right, Mr. Right. Berry, thank you. And I'm going to move on. One last question about the pandemic. Uh, Mr. Berry, this is for you. Should wearing masks be mandatory during this pandemic? Absolutely. And, you know, again, we have a family business that if we didn't have uh, proper safety precautions put in, wearing masks, being over overboard on taking safety precautions of cleaning everything, making sure everyone has a safe experience at our family uh, establishment, we wouldn't be in business we wouldn't deserve to be and when you see someone with a mask when you see someone following safety precautions you know that you're safe to go in that business you're in and in, uh, in be a customer there 
So that's what we need to make sure is that people feel safe and that people know that they're safe. And if science dictates that we need to wear masks to prevent uh, any of the curve rising, then that's what we should do. All right, Mr. Cooney. Fully agree. I've been wearing a mask since day one. It's the right thing to do and it's the safe thing to do. And I think so many of our neighbors and residents here in Monroe County have been doing the same thing. That's how we have these great results. You know, if it wasn't again, uh, for good leadership from our governor, from our county executive, from our medical leadership right here in town. If we didn't have that example, uh, then we wouldn't be in this position today. I just wish it would be uh, followed by our friends down in Washington, D.C. There's a lot of things down in Washington I wish were followed. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mr. Cooney. All right, Mr. Cooney. We're going to move on to a different topic now. Uh, this question is for you. What was your reaction to the death of Daniel Prude? And do you think law enforcement bears any responsibility for Mr. Prude's death? I was very angry and I was very sad at the killing of Daniel Prude. Um, Diane and I live right downtown between the Public Safety Building and Martin Luther King Jr. Park. We hear the protests outside our windows most nights. In fact, we've been out there and protesting and peaceful vigils uh, throughout the summer. We're very upset because we know that this is not an isolated incident. Whether it's George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, these are incidents that have been happening over the past few months, but these have been happening for decades. Systemic racism has existed in our police departments, existed in our criminal justice system, existed in our workplaces. So much injustice has been done uh, to communities of color. And what happened to Daniel Prude was absolutely wrong. Uh, it, it could have been preventable. We have to learn from this. And if we don't stand up and use this as an opportunity to make meaningful change at the state level when it comes to mental health services, when it comes to healthcare delivery, when it comes to how we appropriate respond, appropriately respond to a mental health crisis, then we're not doing our jobs. And I'm committed to making sure that not only the family of Mr. Prude, but the people of this community know that I stand with them and I will do everything in my power to make sure this never happens again in the state of New York. Mr. Barry? I agree with, with a lot of what Jeremy said there. And you know, when you watch the video, it is heartbreaking. And you can't help but feel bad for the Prude family who lost someone that night. Any death is something that's sad and we should mourn and share our prayers and share our love and comfort with those that have gone through this. And you know what, when we uh, had this topic, I thought Sheriff Baxter did a great job trying to unite the community and bring them together by trying to say we need to be a bridge and we need to have a collaborative unity effort. And not just buzzwords, not just having uh, a talk at a table or just doing something for one news day. It needs to be a collaborative effort with the entire community. And you need to have police officers at the table. You need to have op, uh, folks from every organization that feels touched by this to be there. And it will be a long process. This is not an overnight uh, process to be one and done with. This is something that we need to come together as a community to do it together, to not uh, shout things at one another, to not make things worse, to not have a divide, to not, uh, to not push one another away. We need to bring each other together. We need to be a united community because that's what will make us great. All right, Mr. Barry, I'm going to continue Barry. with this line of questioning. Um, before Mr. Prude's death became public, the nation was reeling from the killing of George Floyd in Minneapolis. So in New York State, police departments are now under orders by the governor to reimagine how they're going to protect and serve their communities. How do you think law enforcement can better serve our community, especially people of color, and what should the state do to support that? If it involves additional resources, by the way, how would you pay for it? First of all, I want to thank our law enforcement. They still serve our public safety needs throughout the, throughout the United States, throughout New York State, and throughout our community and here in the 56th. So I thank our law enforcement, and I'm proud to have their endorsements. I'm proud to stand with those that stand by us in a time of need and a time of public safety. There are also ways to bring training. You know, just to go back to the Daniel Prude case for a moment, if the way that call was handled was different, if you had, again, like Sheriff Baxter said, if you could have a drug resource officer, a mental health resource officer, anything like a call like that comes in, you then have the resources for our police officers to be with. They can make sure that the scene is safe 
and they can also make sure that the drug resource officers and the mental health experts are there to do their jobs. So again, it's a collaboration. It's not a one size fits all. It's not something that's gonna be uh, fixed with one solution. It's all of us working together and making sure that those who are protecting us are safe and those that who they are protecting are safe as well. Mr. Cooney, would you, Mr. Like, to Cooney, would you like to respond? I would. Uh, I would add to that that when we talk about reimagining our police departments, it also entails a conversation about resources and where we're investing those resources. I would like to see resources invested in youth development, children's services. Many people know that I used to work for the YMCA. There's so many great programs that we could be expanding, especially in our urban community. Uh, I'd like to also see uh, invested resources in workforce development and anti-poverty initiatives, not just more talking, but we know the work that needs to be done in terms of workforce training right in our center city. Also, we need to focus on mental health and having culturally competent mental health providers located in not only our city, but in suburban and rural parts of our county. And there is a lack of access. And so when we talk about policing and reimagining policing, I imagine resources being reallocated to not, so that we can prevent more of these acts from occurring, but also keep our neighbors safe. All right, Mr. Right. Berry. Yeah. I'm sorry, just if I could. You know, as the executive director for the County Youth Bureau, I created and funded several youth development activities and youth development programs that did just what Jeremy is suggesting. And it is, that's part of that collaborative effort. And when we're talking about restructuring any kind of funding, we cannot take funding away from law enforcement. We need to make sure that they have the resources and the ability to keep us safe. That's job one. And if we take away resources, they cannot do that. But I also agree with keeping everyone together as a collaborative. And when we talk about mental health, I ran something called the Safe Harbor Initiative, which defended our children and rescued them from being sex trafficked. And we needed mental health resources to come in there, not just for those that were uh, being trafficked, but for those who were also providing the rescues, because it's a traumatic event. We need to make sure mental health resources are available to everyone that serve in our state. All right, Mr. Berry, thank you. We're going to take a quick break right now. Uh, we'll have much more with both candidates for the 56th State Senate District in just a moment. Stay right there.
from your local election headquarters. This is a special presentation of News 8. And welcome back to our debate. We are currently joined by our two candidates for New York's 56th State Senate District. They are Democratic candidate Jeremy Cooney and Republican candidate Mike Berry. Once again, gentlemen, thank you for thank both you. being here tonight. Our next question our next comes question. from the League of Women Voters. It is for Jeremy Cooney. Uh, do you support single payer health care? Why or why not? I do support uh, the New York Health Act, which is a form of single payer. Uh, many of you know I got into this race because of health care, and health care did not work for my family. Um, several years ago, my mom was diagnosed with early onset dementia. It was a very difficult process, and she required a higher level of care. Uh, I lost her a few years ago to cancer, and um, that process was incredibly expensive and frustrating. It just didn't work for my family, and I know it hasn't worked for so many others. Um, in New York, it seems to me that we either try to find the most perfect piece of legislation or we don't do anything at all. We're having this conversation right now on the federal level with the Affordable Care Act, right? You know, a lot of people want to criticize that act, but I'm worried about pre existing health conditions, right? So, what is the alternative? Right now in New York, we do not have an alternative to the New York Health Act. I would be happy to be part of those conversations and shaping meaningful legislation that will make sure that we lower prescription drug costs for our seniors and that we make sure that every child in the state of New York is fully covered. Because if we have all these great health resources, whether at the University of Rochester or Rochester Regional, um, doesn't make a difference if people can't access them. And that's my commitment to families right here in Rochester. Mr. Barry? Mr. Barry? Thanks. You know, I would love to be a part of that conversation too, because it's a conversation that needs to be had. We are all facing at some time, some point in our lives, and Jeremy, my condolences to you losing your mother and having to go through that. That is awful. And we saw our grandfather go through it, my grandmother go through dementia, and I'm talking with all these seniors who are plagued by it right now with assisted living homes. There's a lady uh, by the name of Joanne Miles Thomas who's with her father. She's watching this progression happen. And we talk about both the visitation rights and the seniors' rights within those homes, but also about the health care option as it is. It is costly, and it is a burden on our families. And I think that's where we can find another part of these common grounds. When you talk about political parties and upstate, downstate, we can find the common ground that this is a burden on all of us. And we can accept pre-existing conditions, and we can work with each other, and we can honor each other's health care needs for their families, because that's the way we should attack this, is that we are all family members, and we are all hit by something at one point or another and have these common sense solutions to it. And I, I agree with Jeremy that, you know, we can't have these burdensome uh, regulations that come in and things that prevent us, these obstacles that come in, and we can get through that with common sense solutions and working together, not just as a legislature, but as an entire community. All right, Mr. Berry, uh, the New York Reproductive Health Act protects women's reproductive rights by codifying Roe v. Wade into New York law. If a bill is introduced to repeal this law, how will you vote? Uh, I haven't seen that, but I can tell you right now that I am a pro-life uh, individual that stems from my faith. And, uh, you know, I like to keep everything local and our decision bases are uh, local. That This is about the state Senate. But, you know, if someone's trying to grill me about being pro-faith or uh, pro-life and being a faithful person, have at it. I can't back away from that, nor would I want to. And I know that there have been negative ads about me putting flames behind me and making me look like Satan himself. Uh, I'm not putting that on my opponent, but it did come with him on the other side of it. We should be able to have a rational discussion about this and not just try to make people out to look like bad people merely based on their faith. And, uh, you know, when it comes to women's rights, I have been someone that has defended rights of women, defended our youth. Again, when I was the director of the Safe Harbor Commission and Initiative, I made sure our young women were not trafficked for sex anymore. We rescued them. That was our initiative. And those were the rights that I was worried about, was a young girl being trafficked in our community. And when you say, you know, you're going to talk about the rights of that, what about the rights of those young people who have been trafficked? So again, I'm a pro-faith guy. If you want to have at it, have at it. But I'm going to uh, stand on my laurels with that one. Mr. Cooney? Um, I am a pro-choice Democrat. I do support a woman's right to choose. I am endorsed 
by Planned Parenthood. I am endorsed by the National Institute of Reproductive Health. And I believe in the health care and the needs of women across New York. Um, we can't control the politics of Washington, D.C. We don't know what's going to happen with this new Supreme Court nominee. But what we can do is we can stand up for the rights of New Yorkers. And so I would not support the repeal of the Reproductive Health Act. In fact, I will make sure that we keep that law because it's a protection for every woman in this state. And I feel very strongly about that. And um, that is a clear difference between my opponent and myself. And uh, the voters deserve to know that. And Maureen, I'm glad the voters know it uh, because there are just as many who agree with myself as perhaps would agree with Jeremy. But I just don't want to see the killing of children. Again, and that's why I have devoted my life to working with youth because I want to see them grow, I want to see them live, and I want to see them be successful. All right, we're going to move on to our next question. This is for Mr. Cooney. Uh, New York State recently enacted many election law reforms, but same-day registration and no excuse absentee balloting must be passed again by the legislature and then approved by voters. Do you support same-day registration and no excuse absentee balloting? Why or why not? Yes, both. I think more people voting is a good thing. It's part of our civic responsibility as Americans and as New Yorkers. Um, this pandemic has showed us how many people want to participate in democracy. They're trying their best to do mail-in voting or uh, do early voting, it starts on Saturday, uh, or making sure that they cast their ballot safely on election day on November 3rd. Uh, we want to make sure that as many people have access to their voice being heard in the legislative and in the democratic process in our state and in our country. Um, I will say, in particularly, that same-day registration just makes sense, right? If we're trying to encourage a new generation of civic leadership, then why would we not encourage them to have their voice be heard, whether they're voting in the presidential race or whether they're voting in a state or local race? Every voice matters, and I want to make sure that they have the opportunity to do that. Mr. Barry? Mr. Barry? Yeah, every voice does matter, and we do want more people voting. That is a good thing, to have everyone involved in the process, but we want it in an uncorrupted way. We want to make sure that people are voting and that people are uh, themselves when you see a vote come in. Again, with our senior nursing homes and our assisted living homes, I'm dealing with a family right now who are looking for help. They're saying that their ballot was taken away, their absentee ballot was uh, applied for, not by the senior and not by the family, and there could be corruption there by someone taking that one ballot. If it's happening once, how many times is it happening across the state? What we need to make sure is that we have a responsible voting process in place, and if we can include same-day registration so that it is responsible and that it does make that voice heard, well, then of course that's a good thing. We do want people to vote. We want people to know that their voices are heard. And again, in a local election, what we're talking about, we are in upstate New York, the 56th district. This is local. There's a reason that we have the phrase, all politics is local, because I want everyone in the 56th district to be heard, whether it's a primary election or a general election. Yet a primary election where not everyone felt like their voices were heard. And that was my opponent's party that was doing that. We need to make sure that every voice is heard and that every opportunity to be on the ballot is there as well for people who want to serve our community. All right, Mr. Perry. Would you like to respond again, Mr. Cooney? Mr. Cooney? Okay, let's move on. Uh, so, Mr. Barry, a report by Future Ready Schools, a network of nonprofits, found that 38% of all New York households earning $25,000 or less have no high speed home internet connection. In the city of Rochester, tens of thousands of school kids are struggling to learn at home under these conditions, and there's no long-term fix in sight. What action would you take to ensure that every household in our area has reliable broadband access at an affordable price, whether for school work or personal use? No, Maureen, this is a great question. I'm glad you asked it. You know, as a former public school teacher, I first of all want to commend those who are in the classroom and those doing it virtually at home. I I can't imagine what they're going through on a daily way to create a classroom plan, making sure it's fulfilled and taking care of all of our students. I thank them as a former teacher. I thank them. And I think that the Wi-Fi issue should be surrounding education. If we're asking our students to stay home with their parents and we're asking their parents to stay home, 
We need to at least have accessible Wi-Fi that is capable and that is affordable if we're not gonna fund it ourselves. Now we do have it funded for public safety. Perhaps that's an opportunity to work with the public safety field. You know, in the town of Greece, we made sure that there was a competition, which is the free enterprise market of making sure that we had the best uh, product for our folks here working uh, with the folks at those businesses, trying to get at least some competition to bring prices down. But right now it's a different, it, it, because of COVID, it is a different time. We need to have Wi-Fi available to all of our students and all of our family. And we need to figure out a way to do it. And again, that's gonna be a collaborative effort. It's gonna be reaching across the aisle. And this is one of those places where we can take worries away as government. That's, that's what we're here for, right? Where we can help, we should. So let's try to find a solution where we can provide Wi-Fi to our residents. All right, and just to clarify, Mr. Barry, you'd tie that into education funding? I'm sorry? You would tie that into education funding or private enterprise? It's necessary, but I don't want the resources that are being provided to education to be decimated or taken down or decreased to accomplish that. We need to, you know, in New York State, I know this is a bigger topic. In New York State, we don't have a revenue problem. We have a spending problem. We need to take a look at what we're spending our dollars on and make sure we're providing quality education and the resources our family need, uh, our families need to get that to our kids. All right, thank you, Mr. Barry. Mr. Cooney, would you like to respond at all? I would. There was an article in the paper this, this week talking about how a number of Rochester City School District uh, students had hit their data caps from the MIFIs that were passed out uh, because they've been on virtual learning. And I, I was furious. I was absolutely angry. You know, I'm a proud graduate of the Rochester City School District. If elected, I'll be the first Rochester City School District graduate in the state Senate in almost 50 years. Um, this, is a, this is inexcusable. And I applaud our district for trying their best to navigate in a very difficult time. But to have a conversation about how students can't access and talk to their teachers through Google Classroom or Zoom because we can't figure out the technology is unacceptable. And um, I agree with, with my opponent that, you know, this is a resource issue. We can't take away from additional resources. You know, school districts are already underfunded, right? Rochester City School District is owed upwards of $89 million already. Uh, so we have a real problem when it comes to technology. I would like to incentivize the private market to be able to provide this internet, but I do believe that this is becoming a new digital right. 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 If we're going to start learning and having classroom experiences virtually, and whether we're in a pandemic or not, we need to make sure that every single student has access to high quality broadband, whether they live in a rural part of our county, whether Thank they live in the inner city. All right. Thank you, Mr. Cooney. So this question also for Mr. Cooney, what are your ideas for making New York a more small business friendly state? Where to, where to start? <laughs> There's a lot we can do on that front. First of all, we need to recognize how many overly burdensome regulations we put on small businesses. I know that as a lawyer, right? Representing a number of small businesses, working with so many friends who own their small businesses, maybe they're transferring it from their, uh, from their parents and becoming small business owners themselves now. Um, this is an opportunity for us to do better, especially if, as we compete with other states across the country for this type of town. Um, we are no longer Kodak Town. We are no longer the town of big corporations. We are a community of small businesses who employ the majority of people in our community. They treat employees very well. And we need to make it easier for them to do business, not only here in the Finger Lakes region, but also across uh, either state lines or across the world. That is the technology and that is the system and environment that we live in today. So uh, we need to make uh, government less burdensome. We need to have a pipeline of a communication for small business owners, whether they're working through the Chamber of Commerce or whether, whether they're go going directly to a state legislator to be able to get answers. A lot of times these small business owners aren't able to get simple answers. Uh, and it's very frustrating. They're just trying to keep the lights on. Uh, so especially as we recover from this pandemic, we need to be more proactive with how we work with small business owners and how we support them and their families. Right. Thank you. Mr. Barry? Thanks, Maureen. Uh, you know, I come from a family, I said, of uh, small business owners, and there really is no such thing as small business. It's business. 
And we wanna make sure that we treat each one uh, with everything that we can to make sure that they thrive and survive. You know, my grandfather had a restaurant, my brother, my sister-in-law have a restaurant, my sister has a yoga studio. It sounds like everyone's doing well except me. No, I'm just kidding. We have to make sure though that we have small business owners to remove those mandates that are placed upon them. And you know what, making, uh, being proactive and making your environment, your town, your municipalities, your city vibrant is important. I have an experience of doing that. We have something coming in the town of Greece that might be very exciting for job workers, uh, uh, for possible employees. We're looking at something pretty big. And you know how we're gonna land that is by being a place where people wanna conduct business. We have small businesses and large businesses alike. And the reason is, is because we make it known to them, we want you here. We want you to provide jobs. We don't want to be like the crazy AOCs down in New York City that want to keep businesses from coming in. We want to promote business so we can have jobs for our families, so our young people aren't going to other states to have a family of their own. We want, it, we want everyone to be part of our family, and, and, and not to be naive or not to sound uh, saccharine about it, but we want everyone to feel like they're part of the family, that you can come in, have a business, people are going to want to go to your business, and that people are going to want to work at your business. You do that by being proactive. And, you know, uh, we have, again, it, it's a enthusiastic approach, it's a collaborative approach, and it's taking away needless mandates from business that want to set up shop in your municipalities. All right. Mr. Berry, thank you. Uh, within the 56th district, there is a huge disparity when it comes to income, Mr. Berry. Rochester has some of the highest rates of poverty in the nation, and there are some surrounding towns that rank among the wealthiest. Do you see this as a problem? Why or why not? And what, if anything, should the state be doing to address this gap? Of course, poverty is an issue. And of course, poverty is a problem. And it has been something that's been around since Moby Dick was a minnow. We need to make sure that we as a community rally around those who are in need. We need to make sure that people have the services that they need and the resources that they need to become employed. And you know, I was a part of something in the youth bureau where we found young people who wanted to work, people who were suffering and we found out and we helped out by working with private organizations, private business, nonprofits, and brought them the education and the extra learning that they need. These were part of those youth development learning programs that I worked with and created. We wanna empower young people. We wanna empower people who are in poverty, who have been identified. We had things that would try to not just remedy that, but we came up with things like the Pirate Toy Fund, working with Gary the Happy Pirate and his folks. We brought thousands of holiday toys to kids that were in need by working with Gary and his folks, by working with DHS, because people around assistance needed a break. They needed someone that wanted to help. Gary wanted to help. We needed to show our community that, yes, you can trivial, try to trivialize it by saying, oh, it's a holiday toy. It meant everything to these families who came through the doors on a Sunday in December at the Blue Cross Arena, and I was proud to be able to do that. The tears that were flowing that day to witness people who might not have seen poverty in our area, that was a big stand up time for them. They finally realized, oh my gosh, this is in our community and we need to help. It brought everyone joy that day. We can do that on a larger scale and not just with toys, but with actual resources, learning programs, job opportunities, and working with uh, our municipalities and nonprofits alike. We have to work with our school districts as well. As the Youth Bureau Director, we brought hundreds and hundreds of coats to in-need students because they didn't have the coats they needed to get to, to, get to school in January in Rochester. Refugee students were coming in, families were coming in. They had no idea what our climate was about. They were sending their children to school in long sleeves because that's all they had and that's all they knew about. All right, Mr. Berry. When School 17 reached out for help to the county, they called the Youth Bureau and said, Mike Berry, what can you do to help us? We reached out to other stores. We made sure that kids got the coats they needed and the boots they needed to get to school for right. a quality education and to help get out of poverty. Because we all Barry, know education is the gateway out of poverty. All right, thank you, Mr. Barry. You, Mr. Barry. Mr. Cooney, would you like to add to that at all? I would. You can live your whole life in Rochester or Monroe County and not see the extreme levels and see extreme concentration of poverty that we have. For me, this is, very personal. I was raised in, in the city of Rochester by a single mom. I graduated from Rochester City Schools and I've had the chance to work at City Hall 
And the levels of poverty are appalling, but you can't have a conversation about poverty without having a conversation about healthcare access, without having a conversation about making sure that our schools are fully funded, without having a conversation about transportation, making sure that people who live in the center city can get out to the more rural parts of our county where the jobs are being created. It takes a leader who understands that intersectionality and who has the ability to be able to bring home the resources, to be able to invest in education, healthcare, and transportation, to be able to finally turn this giant ship of poverty around. I'm tired of talking. I'm tired of having tables and commissions and blue ribbon panels. It's time to get to work, and I look forward to doing that. All right, we're going to uh, fit in one more question here as we begin to wind up. Uh, Mr. Cooney, this question is for you. Uh, the man you're seeking to follow in uh, politics here is the longtime public servant Joe Robach. He has lamented the domination of a New York City driven agenda in state politics. Do you agree this is a problem? How does it manifest? And if it is a problem, what would you do that Mr. Robach could not do to change this? I couldn't be more excited for upstate New York. We have a number of incredible candidates running for office in a time when we have not had a voice at the table. There are 63 senators in New York, 40 of whom are part of the Democratic majority. We haven't had this large of a Democratic majority in the state Senate since 1912. How many are from upstate New York? Three, Albany, Syracuse, and Buffalo. Who's missing? Rochester. And we've got candidates from Jamestown to Albany who are running on an exciting platform, a positive platform to bring change and a voice to the issues that we're uniquely facing in upstate New York. So I hope to be part of a new generation of leadership in Albany, a new coalition of upstate Democrats. I've already started those conversations with Senator Kennedy, Senator May, Senator Breslin who are ready for a new generation of upstaters to come to Albany and talk about the issues that we're facing. You know, we're never talking about the out-migration uh, from upstate New York. Why? Because we don't have a voice in the Democratic-controlled majority. But that's going to change. Right. And that's going to change in a very big way in just a few weeks. Mr. And I'm very excited to be a leader in that process. All right. Mr. Cooney, thank you. Mr. Mr. Barry, how about you? Thanks. And you know what, Senator Rollback, just, you know, give props to him for a second. He has served this community with a plum and enthusiasm that should be celebrated, and his legacy will be who carries it on. And you want to make sure that it's someone who is born and raised, worked here, has the family here. 56 is so unique. I got a brother in Hamlin, a sister in Brighton. Uh, you know, we have a bunch of folks in Greece. We're all over the place. And because we love the entire community and it makes it, we've made it our home. But when you talk about New York City influence and what it does to us, Senator Robach has been a huge fighter. In fact, he puts it in uh, every couple of years through a cycle that New York City shouldn't be part of New York State. And he sometimes, people think he does it tongue in cheek, but he wants to show what resources go to New York State and can be taken from upstate New York. You want to have an upstate New York energy, you come around the 56, you go to each of the towns and you see the farmers in Hilton, the business employees in Greece, you see everyone that's doing their fair share and their work. And you can see it in even political donations. Our donations, we want to be a grassroots campaign. This is a time where everyone's suffering, Everyone has burdens, and you don't want to ask them for a single dollar for a political campaign, but you need it because the cause is so great and the mission is so great. We've had people pouring in from all around our district. We don't want those outside the dollars, not because they're bad or anything like that, but this is an upstate fight. We want to make sure that we keep everything upstate. And if you accept downstate right, Mr. dollars, Mr. well, Barry, then you're going to be beholden to them when you're making decisions about upstate. Mr. And you Barry, can't we're going to have we're going to have to cut you off right there. I can tell that you're very passionate about that, as was Mr. Robach. Uh, but we do need to move on to closing statements right now. Uh, we're going to begin our closing statements with Mr. Cooney. He has one minute. In our country and in New York, we value opportunity, the chance to work hard and to start a family. But that opportunity is at risk because we know that we have not only the COVID epidemic, but we don't have a seat at the table when it comes to decision-making in Albany. I have been working over the last three years, talking with thousands of voters about healthcare access, about school funding, about climate change, about racial inequality. 
These are the issues that are going to be on the ballot this November. And we need to elect a leader who understands them and will be a fighter for them in Albany. I am a proud son of Rochester. I was raised here. I was educated here. And Diane and I are starting a family here. It would be the honor of a lifetime to serve as the next New York State Senator for the 56th District. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And we're going to hear now from Mr. Barry. Thanks. You know, we've gone through so much over the last few months, COVID, racial tension, and political divide. Uncertainty and frustration are permeating our society. Violence is on the rise. We can feel the tension every day. I'm a former English teacher and basketball coach, and lately I've been thinking of a poem that I use in the classroom and locker room. You know, and it says, the shiny trophies on our shelves can never win tomorrow's game. You and I know deeper down, there's always a chance to win the crown, but we fail to give our best. We simply haven't met the test of giving all and saving none until the game is really won, of showing what is meant by grit, of fighting on when others quit, of dreaming there's a goal ahead, of hoping when our dreams are dead, and of praying when our hopes have fled. For who can ask more of a man than giving all within his span? And so the fates are seldom wrong, no matter how they twist and whine. It's you and I who make our fates. We open up or close the gates on the road ahead or the road behind. You know, the twists and turns that we're facing as a community are brutal. We can either keep forging ahead and pushing forward, and that's what we've chosen to do. Our family last name means to push forward in the old Irish. Right. And we do that through a, unit, a unified and collaborative front. Right. You see no gloss, no errors on our campaign. What you see is what you get. All right. You want a servant that is here to serve you. All right, Mr. Barry, and you know Mr. what? Barry. We don't need negative campaigns. You need someone who is going to be there to fight for you not talk about All things right. that don't matter to us. We're local, we're here in upstate New York, and we wanna fight for that local upstate. Mr. And I'm the fighter that's gonna get it done as the next New York State Senator right. in the 56th Mr. District. Mr. Barry, Mr. thank Barry. you so much. Time is ticking. Thanks as well to retiring State Senator Joe Robach for his many years of service to this community. It will soon be a new era in the 56th State Senate District. Thank you so much for joining us. Remember to vote.